anybody ever gone to the doctor and asked for a prognosis? Basically, you tell me what's about to happen. Tell me how this is going to go in surgery or after surgery or instead of surgery or whatever the case may be. Prognosis, except the G is silent, so it's gnosis. Pro, no, it's a compound. Pro means before. In English, we just change the O to an E. We use pre. The common word for knowledge is gnosis. So it's where we get our word gnostic. It's where we get our word agnostic, which is to say, I don't know something. Ah, gnosis, I don't know it. When it's we're used in scripture, it's used to describe the activity of God, to decree, to purpose something. Welcome back to our study of the New Testament book of 1 Peter. I'm Mike Morris. If you don't know me, I'm one of the associates here. Welcome on live stream if you're with us today. Uh, we're we're going to be picking it up in uh, chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to just read that again. Not going to really cover too much depth on it, but we're, we're going to focus on verse 2. Verse 2, Mike? Yes, just one verse tonight. We'll pick up the pace after that, but it's going to be one verse tonight. So uh, I, I'm... The more I read this book, the more convinced I am that this book is the book for our time, for this moment in history, and into our immediate future, I believe. It's a, it's a, it's a message for all churches, for all believers, and for verse-by-verse -verse fellowship, for sure. So we are delighted to see you here. So let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, I pray you guide us and direct us tonight. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. We need to hear your voice. We need to know your thoughts, your ways. For Lord, we'll, we know that they're not like ours. You've told us that and we understand it well. And Father, I pray that you would uh, correct our thinking in many places, perhaps tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would draw us into greater maturity as we see what you spoke to the Christians of Asia Minor through Peter, and Father, to the church of all the ages, every day since. We love you. We thank you. Guide us and direct us in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, open again uh, tonight with our graphic slide. Uh, in that, he, it's just so grateful for Kyle's work. Uh, he can make any Bible study look good, even one I teach. So I'm really grateful for the ones that he's done in Philippians and Ephesians and the 12 and now this one as well. So our goal tonight is to build on what we learned last week about Peter, uh, the book itself, the context, the first recipients of the book, all the things that we understood uh, about the introduction and begin to understand the message of this book. What does the book really say to us today? not just what it meant in that day, uh, but everything uh, that it means to us today. And you know, every book in the Bible, there's none of them that are here by accident. God didn't look down and go, oh, I thought I deleted that one. There's, they're all here on purpose. And so we need to understand, when you read a book, I would encourage you somewhere in the back of your mind, be asking the question, wonder why this one's here. I think this one is here to prepare people to suffer. I think that's why. This book is here. It would be evident that that's what it was there for in the first century. And I think that it's, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, there was suffering then and there's suffering today. No, there's been suffering for the church for every year of its existence. There's never been a time when the church didn't undergo suffering. And so that's what makes this book's message so universal and timeless is that it, it fits every, every time. But boy, it sure fits ours and we're grateful that God gave it. Now, uh, so we need to get started. Now, I'm, we're going to say this out loud. No fair looking at the screen, right? This was our memory verse. This is our theme verse. Here we go. I'm going to try to like not look at the slide, not look at my notes. Ready? Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good, 1 Peter 4.19. I'm not sure how you memorize verses, or if actually if you memorize verses. Anybody do that as a habit? I'm not gonna, you don't get more brownie points, God, in looking down here going, wow, good job down there. But here's how I do it, and maybe this will help you. What's the hardest part of these things to remember? The reference, the book of the words, very good. 
I'm docking you a point. That's not, <laughs> not good. It's usually connecting the verse. The verse is a sentence. We use sentences all the time. We understand those, but it's connecting it to the fact that it's 1 Peter 4.19. Because that's just this fact hanging out in midair, right? Like, what in the world? How can I connect them? So I've made it a habit. Whenever I start, I break it up into, into phrases, and I will say the, the reference at the beginning and the end. Because if I've got to repeat something twice, it's going to be that part of it for me, First Peter. So I will say it this way. First Peter 4.19, let those who suffer, First Peter 4.19. 1 Peter 4.19, let those who suffer according to God's will, 1 Peter 4.19. 1 Peter 4.19, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls, 1 Peter 4.19. You get the point, right? Add a phrase every time, but always put the reference at the front and the back because that's what you got to hammer down into your, into your head, right? It's the hardest part. So if, if that helps you, great. And if not, don't. Use something else, some other some other. Uh, some other tool or technique that you have. So tonight we're going to start again in verse one and we're going to continue through verse two and then we're, uh, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit, I think probably three through five. I have sketched this out in pencil. I think it's going to take 17 sessions, which is not overly long. It's not like we're tackling Isaiah, <laughs> but it's not you know a one, a one chapter book either. So it, it, we'll be finishing it uh, towards the end of the summer and early fall. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. All one sentence. Even in English, it's just commas. So we looked at the last uh, last time at Peter, an apostle, what does elect mean? What do, who are exiles? What in the world do you mean by the word dispersion? And what are these place names? And why does it matter? Tonight, we're going to pick it up at verse 2, where he begins uh, with four phrases. One, some might argue three. Some would say five. The may grace and peace be multiplied to you is at the end, granted. But before that, I think there are some things we really need to, to camp on. Uh, I hope you had the time this week to look at the book, read it over. Uh, a mentor of mine who's gone on to be with the Lord said several times to me that repetition is the price of learning. And he said it again and again and again and again. Why? Because it is. It really is true. It's a rare person that memorizes something on the very first time he or she sees it. Right. So understanding things generally takes repetition. So that's what I hope that we will do as you read this book over and over. There's no substitute for hiding that word in your heart and in your mind. So we're going to review just a little bit. The author, Simon Peter, despite what critics may say, I am utterly convinced that he actually wrote the book. The leading apostle of the 12, commissioned by Christ, that's Simon Peter. Simon's a very common name, uh, and so was Peter, but few, only one, had both put together. Simon Peter, we know him in the gospel accounts. The recipients of the letter are those who are elect, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I reached back to this verse, which we've looked at before in the summer of 20, uh, Ephesians 1. It's right up near the front. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every speech. Paul loves run-on sentences too, who is blessed, blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose, that's the same word, chose us, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. What was the point of God choosing us? That we would be holy and blameless before him. And there's more that goes on after that verse, but, or those two, but that's the same thought. Paul uses the word choose. He often uses the word elect too. We'll see that tonight. But Peter chooses the word elect in the beginning of this book. Uh, and yet, while believers are the elect ones, right? Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, uh, here in this world, you wouldn't call us chosen, would you, in the eyes of the world? That's why he uses the word exiles. We're foreigners. We're citizens of a distant country. Not, we're not from here. And we're not accepted here. And you see that Jesus, if it's any consolation, neither was Jesus. If the world hates you, he said in the Gospels in John 15, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Why? The world loves those who are of the world. 
Not too hard to understand that. But because you're not of this world, why am I not of this world? I chose you out of it. You're no longer a part of this world. That's the, that's the meaning of that, the powerful meaning of that word. He chose, he elected to prefer or select from among alternatives. Every believer understands that word from an experiential point of view. We are that group. We have nothing to be proud about in it. It wasn't because of us. I can look around at you and say, well, maybe it's all the smart people, all the beautiful people. And then I look at myself and I go, well, I'm in the same group and I'm not either of those things. So it can't be that. He chose us, not because of anything in ourselves, but simply because of his grace. Therefore, the world hates you. So if you ever go, gosh, why, does, why are things so hard on Christians in this world? John 15, 18 and 19 tells us. So here in this first verse, uh, Peter really sets up the main theme of the book. Christians are gonna experience suffering at the hands of the triumvirate of evil, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Why? Because we don't belong here. We're sojourners here. We're not natives of this place. And I love the world. I mean, I, I think it's beautiful. Think what it would be like, what it's going to be like when he remakes it into a new heaven and a new earth. It's gonna be even better, even better. I believe it'll rain in the new heaven and new earth <laughs> instead of where we are right now. Maybe it won't be 116 degrees. So as the, the Greek word parapetimos, as exiles, were scattered, dispersed by reason of the persecution. Remember we talked about that in Acts chapter eight, verse one. The believers were scattered. Christians left Jerusalem, traveled out to the far reaches of the Roman Empire, certainly to Asia, uh, as Peter writes this, uh, this circular letter as it circulated among the churches of that region in what's today modern day Turkey. Now we're gonna go on to verse two. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ, and sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. This short little verse, just one verse, is like a treasure box of truth when you start to unpack it about the work of God and salvation. It's, and it's just the beginning of the gospel richness that we find in this, in this book. If you have never studied this book to the depth that we're going to, you're going to be amazed at what's in here. It is an astonishing um, trove, <laughs> if you will. So let's look carefully. Did you notice this? If, if people have ever thought, you know, ever people ever say to you, oh, there's not a, there's not a, you know, there's just God, there's just God. There's no God the Father, God the Son. Nowhere in the Bible is it teach the Trinity. Right here. The foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the, Spirit, for the obedience of God the Son. They're all right here. And grace and peace on top of all that. He identifies the believers, but then he continues. Now, listen carefully to this. He, here are the questions. He answers questions without ever posing the questions. So what I wanted to do tonight was pose the questions. We need to understand what it is that he's telling us here in this verse. If we've wondered how are people found to be in Christ, how does that happen? How is it that any of us ever are saved? That's one question he answers here. How are they to live in the present world as the redeemed? I mean, let's say you're saved. Now what? Now what do I do? How do I live in this world that doesn't accept me and hates me as Jesus tells me, right? John 15. And then also, why would the Father ever save anybody? We're going to see answers to all that. And he finishes with this heartfelt greeting. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So let's start with that first phrase. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, how are believers saved? How are they brought by grace through faith to the state of being redeemed? How does that happen? That's part of the challenge, I think, that we, that we need to understand. And this is not all of the answer, Okay. This verse is not all of the answer, but it does give us a very significant part of the answer. 
that we see. And you can't overlook this short prepositional phrase at the beginning of it, according to. It's according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. To answer the question, has anyone saved? Has anyone uh, elected, if you will, to use that word in verse one? Peter begins by telling us the state of being redeemed is accomplished by the description that follows. He said, how is it that God does it? It's according to something. It's in accordance with, might, might be another phrase that you would use, in accordance with something. What is it? This fundamental truth. What is that truth? It's the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, we need to understand what that foundational truth is. It answers the question mankind has asked since the creation. How can a person be made right with God? How? It's the Philippian jailer. How can I be saved? How can I be delivered? from certain judgment. That's the question that mankind faces if they're honest with themselves. Some people just shut it out of their mind, right? And never think of it. If I just forget it, it'll go away in a while. But a, a, a thinking person is going to attempt, I think, to wrestle with that question. How is it that I ever come to faith in Christ? Well, the world's got a lot of answers to that question uh, and, and all of them are wrong, by the way. How, what does the world say? If the world, if, you, if the world were to answer the question, "How are you saved?" What do you think they would say? Go ahead. Good works. That's a good one. Yeah. What's that? Another one. Good works. Yeah. Just be a good person. You ever heard that? You ever heard it out of your own mouth before you came to faith in Jesus? Yeah. The first thing I thought of is, and it's becoming more and more a thing. Earlier, I guess in my life, if somebody asked the question, "How would I be saved?" They might differ on how but they probably wouldn't debate that it's necessary. Now, I think what you hear is you don't need to be saved at all. It's just a religious myth. It's just something that religious people say to try to scare you into coming to church. You're good just like you are. There's no righteous judge watching over you. You will never be held accountable for your actions by some divine being. Just live your best life now while you can. Why? Because you only live once. So you better live all that you can now, right? Because there's nothing after death. That's the view of some people in the world. There's, to, to even talk about salvation is to talk about something that makes no sense to them whatsoever. But there's a second thing. It's what Tim said a second ago. You're saved by good works. How, how, how can I be saved? Just help people. Do at the bumper sticker, do random acts of kindness. Try not to be mean or lie or steal unless you really have to or you think it'll help you. Then it's probably okay. But you know, just don't kill anyone. And whatever you do, don't judge anyone else for their beliefs or their Values because you know we're all right and good in our own ways, except those intolerant Christians. But there's a third way too. I can just be saved by being better than all the bad people I know because it's all relative. I just have to be, you know, you know the joke about like how do you how do you survive a bear attack? You know, I don't have to be faster than. The bear, I just have to be faster than the guy next to me. And let the bear get him instead. That's this, in a sense. I, I, I just want to be able, to, at the end of my life, if there's a God, I want to be able to turn to that God and say, I wasn't as bad as all those other people. Fill in the blank. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be better than a few others. And maybe that's the bar that people set for themselves in life. None of those are correct. And by correct, I mean, what does the word of God say? It says that we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. If you ever wondered, you know, what, what verses you might use to talk about the gospel with people, I, these are some good ones. They're not the only ones, but they're good ones. Paul goes to great lengths in the first three chapters of Romans to describe just how wicked mankind is, kind of sums it up with, with this passage here, this verse, as he gets closer to the end of the third chapter. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
what happens? Who cares? Because, well, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we saw there's a problem. We saw that the wages of that problem, the results of that problem is death. But then he introduces the solution. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The miracle is that I don't have to get cleaned up first. God shows his love towards us and that while I was in that sinful state, right, God still loves me. Christ died for me. Then Christ died for me? Why did he have to die for me? Then he can kind of talk about, well, because sin is worthy of death. I've been reading a book lately. I'll refer to it actually tonight. I recommend it to you. Uh, Andrew Murray, Abiding in Christ. And he, he said that uh, the, the Levitical law really was focused on one thing. Why all the bloodshed? Somebody calculated this. Mil, over a million gallons of blood shed of animals and such. Sin, what was that to really teach us? Sin brings death and sin demands death. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It is blood guiltiness that we have. And the only way to shed, to, to be forgiven for that is to have someone die on our behalf. And that's the message of this verse of 5.8. Christ died for us. How, how do I do that? How do I turn to Jesus? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord. Believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. With the mouth, one, is, one confesses and is saved. You turn in faith. You turn in trust right, to, to, to the Lord. I think a lot of us know that one. And probably these last two. Well, what happens then? We are not condemned anymore. I think all of us have, I think deep down in the human soul, there is the sense that something is not right in us. We stand condemned. I may rail against it. I may push back. I may reject that notion. I may die that way. But the truth of the matter is, according to God, all of us are unless you're in Christ Jesus. Well, what happens if I am? Well, you're not condemned, but even better, well, pretty good, right up there with not, no condemnation. We have peace with God. Mm. The hostility that separated us, the enmity, a good King James word, the enmity that separated us has been set aside and we have been forgiven and brought near. That's the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. And my goodness, when you realize how lost we are, it is really good news. So don't believe the lies of the world. The, there are people out there to tell you, you know, how to be saved and, and what, you, what you need to do and not do and all of that. Apart, listen, apart from Jesus Christ, mankind is lost. And we're in the express lane going straight to hell. That's where we are without Jesus. And we can't save ourselves. Our sovereign God initiates and consummates that salvation. We contribute nothing to it. It's a long passage, but I want you to listen carefully to this. Ephesians chapter two. Is that a warning? That's okay. Ephesians two, and I clipped some out. I didn't want to read the entire all the way through verse 12, but you'll get the point. And you were, this is Paul writing to the Ephesians, right? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's a pretty hopeless condition right there. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And it's not your own doing. Did you save yourself? No, I didn't. It is the gift, unmerited favor, grace, kairos, not a result of works so that no one would boast. We were dead. In our, we weren't sick in our trespasses and sins. We weren't, you know, limping in our trespasses and sins. We were dead. Dead. What's that mean, Mike? Do I really have to explain that? No, we were dead. We were physically walking around, but spiritually, we were dead. God made us alive. He acted when we couldn't, when wouldn't. Salvation is his work. It's not a cooperative effort, as a lot of churches present it. Let me show you a simple picture, and any picture that I draw using PowerPoint is by definition a simple picture. Can you see that? I tried to make the words bigger. 
Look on the left, that's a timeline with an arrow in each end. It's like eternity past and eternity future. And in between is a lifetime of sorts, right? Birth and death, you'll probably see those words. There's a lot of things, a lot of words the Bible uses to talk about elements that I would say elements of salvation, things that, that are elements of how the Bible describes this idea of saving humanity or saving people. Those are some of the more important, not every word, but it's some of the more important words that you'll recognize. The one furthest to the left, in other words, the first one, chronologically speaking, is the one that Peter uses here foreknowledge, or in, in, in verb form, foreknow, God foreknew us. What does that mean, Mike? Well, it's functionally the same as choose and elect. Well, it sounds like it's just God is really smart and he knew something we didn't know. No, um, because that would be, there would be no need to call anything out in particular because God knows everything, right? I mean, omniscience kind of covers that idea that God knows everything before anything else. It is the word, and you've used the word before. You were speaking Greek and didn't know it. Prognosis. Anybody ever gone to the doctor and asked for a prognosis? Oh, I do. When I was going to the doctor more frequently, I was going, basically, you tell me what's about to happen. Tell me how this is going to go in surgery or after surgery or instead of surgery or whatever the case may be. Pro gnosis, except the G is silent, so it's gnosis. Pro, no, it's a compound, like a lot of words are. Uh, it, the pro means before. In English, we just change the O to an E. We use pre as the prefix that means something came before it, right? Something before something else. The common word for knowledge is gnosis. So it's where we get our word gnostic. It's where we get our word agnostic, which is to say, I don't know something. Ah, gnosis, I don't know it. When somebody says, I'm an agnostic, they mean I don't know enough about God to decide if there is a God. That's what they're trying to tell you. The other word is gnosticism. We know that. It's a, 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 Bob talked about it Sunday. It's this kind of almost semi-New Age religious mystical belief that, that knowledge is everything. But the word basically means to know beforehand, but it's not, uh, when it's were used in Scripture, uh, it is used primarily to describe God's eternal counsel. It is not used that often. But when it is, it's used to describe the activity of God, to decree something, to purpose something. In human history, things that he has considered and intends and will accomplish. It doesn't mean only to know ahead of time, but it describes, and I'm quoting from uh, Dr. Spiros Zodiades, only, what, what it describes are those matters which God favorably, deliberately, and freely chose and ordained. In other words, it describes the intent of God, the purpose of God, and it's described in terms of his knowledge We'll see something else in just a second. Uh, it's used about Jesus in 1 Peter 1, 19. We're gonna see it in a few more weeks. 1, 19b through 21. I'm jumping in the middle of the verse because I'm just trying to save a little bit of space on the slide with the precious blood of Christ, just so you know that the antecedent of he is Jesus. He was what? Foreknown by God. Before the foundation of the world, the same phrase that Paul uses to describe God's foreknowledge and purpose and election choosing of us. He was foreknown, Christ was foreknown, but he was made manifest in the last times, i.e. when Peter's writing this. Jesus has been made manifest, made visible, made uh, known, if you will, in the midst of this moment in the last days, for the sake of you, through him, are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So foreknow can be, and this book is replied to people and it's applied to Jesus. Is it that the father only knew, but didn't cause, didn't purpose the death of Jesus as the redemption for the redemption of mankind? No, he chose and purposed that death. That's what he means when he said he was foreknown. The father foreknew and chose the sacrificial atoning death of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, putting him to death. The father foreknew those 
whom he would give to the son as his bride. We see it in Revelation 19. We see it here in 1 Peter 1. We see all of, now granted, Romans 8, 29 and 30 talks about salvation from God's point of view, not from our point of view. The word repent is not in there. Believe is not in there. Confess is not in there. Faith is not in there. This is God describing how he sees it, all right? There's five important verbs. Those whom he foreknew, same word as Peter used, uses twice. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers and brother, brethren or brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Foreknow, predestined, call, justified, glorified. Let's see if I can successfully go back to this. Hey, look at that. What happens before we ever exist in a physical sense, before our birth, right? Foreknowledge and predestination. That's from before the foundation of the world. We're born. What's, what's the first thing that happens in our, after our birth in terms of our salvation? God calls us. The word is kaleo. God calls us. We repent. We believe. We confess. We're justified. And then God continues that work in us. And he uses the word sanctified, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then we die. And then comes the last part of Romans 8, 29 and 30, which is glorified. So that describes, not in excruciating detail, but in pretty good detail, actually, this, this way that God seems to describe what he's doing for us to understand it. So we're talking about the very first things that God did. That's why they're, they're cloaked in, 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 in eternity past, right? He foreknew. So we're going to come back to 1 Peter 2. Or one, two. Our salvation is according to the foreknowledge of God. It's that's the funda- foundational truth that he's referring to. What is it the Father did in order for us to be saved? He foreknew us from eternity past with the purpose that he would carry all that he had chosen and elected all the way to the finish line, right? All the way to glorification and whatever comes beyond that which we don't even know. It describes the exercise of God's wisdom and intelligence in regards to his eternal purposes. Not his will, that's the word predestined. But foreknow describes his work with regard to knowledge and intelligence. So to return to our initial question, that truth about God's foreknowledge is the, first, is the answer to the first question. How is it that people are ever found in Christ? They're foreknown by the Father. They're foreknown by the Father. So let me ask you this. What does it mean to you when you understand that? That God has foreknown you from before the foundation of the world. He knew you before there was a you to know in a human sense. He, and he saw you and he elected you from among all of the, all the alternatives, to use the, the dictionary language. He, he chose and preferred and selected you from among all the alternatives and said of you, that one is mine. And everything from then on is the outworking of that. He foreknew us. Therefore, his will said, I will destine you ahead of time, predestine you. And ultimately, as you are born and walking this world, I will call you effectively and I will draw you unto myself and I will justify you and I will make you right with me. And someday you will be with me in paradise. That's the gospel. Isn't that good news? Oh my goodness. When I stop and ponder that and think about it, it is more than the human mind, my human mind can fathom. It gives new meaning to the term love and grace when we realize it wasn't about us. It's never been about us. It's about him. It's about the glory that accrues to him. When he, when we are trophies of his grace, when he looks at us and he says, They are who they are because of what I have done in and through them. They are proof of who I am. You can look at a person who knows Jesus and go, there's a God. 
behind that person. Mm. How are people found in Christ? God, God accomplishes our salvation. Second question would be, how are these elect exiles, those whom God foreknew and redeemed, how are they supposed to live in this world? They, they, they come to faith, they, they are justified, and then they have, usually people live a little longer after that. Not always, but usually. You have to live a few more years or days or whatever it might be. However long you are here, right? The, I think the question, how do we live then, is a, is a pretty good question. That's what he tries to talk about here in this, in this second phrase. That's answered with his second statement, in the sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification, boy, that's one of those great big words. We used it on the, I used it on the slide. Uh, Tony talked about it a few weeks ago where he talked about sanctify is to holify. It, it, the, the root is actually where we get our word holy. Hagios, uh, this is the, uh, a, a, ver, a noun form, hagiosmos, same thought. It's sanctification, describing as a noun that which he talks about usually as a verb, be holy. Same root word. Uh, it speaks, now carefully, and we need to understand, it speaks to both the work of the Holy Spirit to take us from being in Adam and place us in Christ, which is another great description of salvation. You, you were in Adam and the Holy Spirit took you and placed you in Christ. Just like you take, you know, clothes from one basket and put them in another or something from a drawer here and you put it in a drawer over here. It's a positional word. It means where you are. It's a, you're in Christ. You were in Adam and now you're in Christ. Paul loves that phrase in Ephesians. Sets us apart unto God, but it's also not just that one moment. It's also every moment that follows that. It's the holiness that God is now producing in us continually as he transforms us into the image of Christ. Have you ever heard the phrase imago Dei? Latin, anybody speak Latin or you ever had to take Latin in high school? Imago meaning image, right? Dei meaning God. We are made imago Dei in the image of God. That's what he's doing in us. You could ask the question, what is it that God is doing in people? What's really the point of all this? He's transforming us to be like Jesus, not to be another Christ. Don't go off the deep end on that, right? But he is saying this, I'm to transform us into the image of Christ. That's what he's doing. We see it referred to again in this verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits, or some translations may say, God chose you from the beginning to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. This is not uh, the, the uh, moment as much as it is the sanctification, that, that lifelong process that happens after you come to faith. It's what you do. I, I don't know if anybody else did this, but I mean, when I came to faith in Jesus, I was in a church, number one. A friend of mine had, uh, watched a Billy Graham crusade and accepted Christ all by himself in his bathtub. Okay, works for me. I happened to be in a church service, in a Southern Baptist church service, and I walked like a mile or however long that aisle was. It seemed like a really long way for me right, to get from the back of the church where all the teenagers sat to the front of the church. And I took the pastor by the hand and I said, I just want to know Jesus. And he said, great. So we got down on our knees and we prayed. And from the moment I got up off my knees, every moment since has been part of this. God's sanctification, God's bringing about the image of Christ in me. As you know, he's got a lot of work left to do. And as I know about you, he's got a lot of work left to do. We're not there. But you know what? He's not quitting either. He's not giving up on us. This is that sanctification. The question for us, I think, is this. How are we sanctified? How does God make us holy? Paul's prayer to come back at 1 Thessalonians again in 5, which Tony's already preached recently, now that may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely make, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. How does God do this sanctification? You know, well, he does it himself for one thing. And he's gonna sanctify us completely. And that's why he lists your whole spirit, soul, and body. Everything about you will ultimately be transformed by the Spirit of God into the image of God, into the image of the Son. 
It's not partial. It's complete and it's entire for he is faithful. Now let me take you to a, a little bit longer passage here. Again, I truncated it a bit. Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13. The bodies of, he's talking about Jesus as the sin offering. The bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. If you go back and look at that passage, sin offerings were always burned outside the camp. They weren't burned at the temple or the tabernacle. They were burned outside the camp. And they were not eaten. A lot of offerings were eaten by the priests and the Levites. That's how they were fed, right? These were not, not sin offerings. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate of Jerusalem. I'm adding that, outside the gate, in order to sanctify the people through his blood. What, where was Jesus? He took the place, positionally, the physical place of the sin offering. He was outside the gate. Why did he suffer out there? there we'll go on, Live or let us go to him. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp. Bear the reproach he endured. The world hated you first. It, hated, or it hates you. It hated me first. That he bore the reproach. Let us go to him outside the camp and bear that same reproach that he endured. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That's the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, like the sin offering, he suffered outside the gate on the cross of Calvary. Not inside the city walls, outside. Why? Why did he have to suffer and die as he did? Because it took his blood to sanctify us, to make us holy. It's, uh, that's the trouble with teaching sometimes. You just are, you struggle with finding a way to describe something that's truly indescribable. He bore our sins, and it was his blood on the cross that sets us apart, makes us holy, transforms us people through his own blood. We need to hear something, church. Don't miss this. We are made holy only through the shed blood of Christ. That's it. How is, it that I, how is it that I could ever be made right with God? How is it that I can be understood to be holy, uh, set apart unto God? It's because he sanctified you through his own shed blood as the sin offering for you and me. How arrogant of us to think that by doing something, I can actually increase my holiness before the Lord. No. We are only made holy through his blood. And it's a lifelong, continuous process. Yes, it, what is our response to this unspeakably precious sacrifice? To purchase a people for himself. We are to go to him. We're to go to him. It says, let us go to him outside the camp. Let us identify with him, to use a word we use often today. Let us go to him and suffer the, 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 the uh, to identify with him in his suffering and accept the reproach that was upon him. And then, you know, it does talk about it, about doing something, but what's the first thing it says? Praise him. Offer a sacrifice of praise. Charlie and I used to talk about how much we loved listening to this church sing. Still happens today with Mark and our same worship team to hear your voices rise up in praise to God is a precious, precious thing. That's what the scripture says. When you get in your heart and mind that Jesus' blood is what saves you. Jesus' blood is what makes you holy. Jesus' blood is what will ultimately glorify you. When you get a hold of that, what else do you do besides praise him? You sing praises to his name. The, lip, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name, his authority, his power, his identity. All of that is wrapped up in the idea of a name.
1 Corinthians 1.30 says this. Because of him, the Father, because of him, you're in Christ Jesus. Why am I in Christ Jesus? Because of the actions of the Father. I thought it was me. I thought I did that. Didn't I do that? No, you didn't. It seems like it works that way. Why do I say that? Because I was sitting in the back of a church and you might've been doing the same thing. It looks for all the world like it was me. I got up, I unpeeled my fingers from the back of the pew ahead of me, all right? And I made my way to the front of the church somehow. What I didn't realize is that God had already elected me from, the, from before the foundation of the world, that I was already his in, in that sense. I was, I was, what I was doing, I was working out that which God had purposed and chosen, foreordained from the eternity past. It just looked like my decision. And it felt that way until you realize that were it not for what he did, I would still be, figuratively speaking, sitting in the back row of that church, lost as a goose. That salvation is him. We are in Christ because of the Father. And in Christ, he has become to us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Oh, my Lord. I just want to look at the middle two of those. Andrew Murray compares the two in his book, and I have gained so much from this. Justification comes first, right, by the blood of Christ. Righteousness, we're declared righteous by the blood of Christ. And then we are continually set apart unto holiness by this, by the Holy Spirit. Righteousness comes first by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And sanctification unto the Lord comes again and again and again and again and again every day by the ongoing work of the Spirit. We're first made right with God, then we're continually set apart unto God by the Holy Spirit. Justification is the work of an instant. It takes about as long as it does for a judge to say, not guilty. We're made right. That, it's even a legal term. That, that moment is followed by a lifetime of a process that the Bible calls sanctification. The one is an instant, the other is, a, is a, the work of years decades. Christians, even longtime believers, I think, sometimes make the mistake of thinking that, yes, we're saved by grace through faith. But after that, I have to live for Jesus. It's up to me to do things and uh, to act and to serve and all of that. I've got to live for him. And sometimes we let that thinking stray into believing that the works are what make us holy. that they can originate from within us. And Paul, Paul refutes that completely in Galatians 3, where he says this, let me ask you only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing from faith? From whence comes the Spirit? Is it because you did something or because you heard and believed? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected? By the flesh, I think a lot of people get stuck there. I know that I was saved by grace through faith, but I think after that, it's all on me. I've got I've to perform. I've got to do more. I've got to be more. I've got to say more. I've got I to give more. I've got to pray more. I've got to read more. All of those things. How is it? Now, are we, and if that's coming from the flesh, do I think for one instant that that's moving me towards holiness? What makes anything holy? God himself possesses it and fills it. And that is what makes everything from a pot in the temple holy to a person. God fills it. That's what, he says, don't think that you, that you started by the Spirit, got that part. No, now I'm being perfected by the flesh. It's not about the law, my friends. It's not about the law. It's about grace. We're sanctified through the Spirit. We're not sanctified through trying really hard <laughs> to, to live for Jesus, doing all sorts of things. We're sanctified through the Spirit by continuing to yield ourselves to the relentless work of the Holy Spirit every single moment of every day. That's why John 15 talks about abiding in Him. You stay there. You don't, it's, it's not like, uh, 
you know, kids in, in uh, Sunday school have always done, and, and our granddaughter did it this past Sunday. You know, they, they make something in Sunday school and they bring it home, or they to make something in school and they bring it home and you put it up on the fridge. It, that isn't what we do with God. God isn't about going, oh, look at that pretty picture you painted. I'll put it right up here. <laughs> He's not interested in that. He's interested in transforming us into the image of who Jesus is. And he does that through his Holy Spirit. And he does it by drawing us unto himself. That's how he perfects us, not according to the flesh. Now, what's our role? Well, the scripture is clear on this. Don't grieve him. All right, but known sin in your life or mine. You can't do that. Uh, you, we, we are to draw near to him. The grace through faith that was the way to salvation in the first place is still the way to sanctification today. We're not made more holy because of anything that we do. We are simply turning to God in faith with empty hands, acknowledging that I'm less than nothing. Paul says it this way, all of our good works are as filthy rags. Only in Christ can I be made acceptable in his sight. All in creation that's made holy is because, as I said, it's possessed by God, it's fully possessed by God. That would include us. It's only by abiding in Jesus that we grow close and grow in closeness and holiness. Are we not commanded to do good works, Mike? Yes, we are. Ephesians 2.10, those prepared for us in Christ Jesus to walk in, right? Yes, we are, but we can't forget. This is where I think a lot of us make the mistake, I have. That the only, I, I forget that the only works acceptable to God are ones done in his strength, not my own. Can you do some things in the flesh? Yeah. And unless you're really careful, God knows, obviously, and you may know, other people probably won't know that you were just doing what you could do. And there are people then that can do a lot in the flesh. I mean, there are people that can really get a lot of things done in the flesh. What a curse. Because it's so easy to think it's about you and about what you do and I do, right? To bring to God and say, look. Remember the, the, where he says... There are people in the last days that, that come before him and say, but oh, look at all the wonderful things we did. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. You never came close. You never drew near to me. You thought it was about acts of piety. Sanctification is about drawing close to, the, to Jesus. Let me ask you this. What? would look different in your life if you look if you took seriously that idea that you were to draw near to God in the spirit would the way you spend your time be different would the way you prioritize activities be different would your devotion be different would it be focused on less on you and more on God I'm facing that challenge every day. Maybe I just want you to come along with me if you're not already there. So I'm not as lonely out there, right? So come on with me. We're going to draw close to God. We're going to abide in him. Now we're going to turn to the, set, to the last question here that he answers. Why'd the Father save us? What's Peter say? For obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Why did he save us? To obey Jesus to be sprinkled with his blood. Let's look at that first phrase. Why are we saved in order to obey Jesus? Well, we are to love him, right? With all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What is, what is the keeping of the commandments? It's proof that you love him. Because why would you keep his commandments any other reason other than I, I just love you, Lord, and I, because of that, I want to keep your word. It also, though, tells us that we love the children of God. How, by this we know that we love God's children when we love God and obey his commandments. So if I'm keeping the word of God, if I'm obeying him, if I'm walking in devotion to him, it's also, it's also gonna draw me closer to those other ones, right? Other people that are doing the same thing when we love the children of God. There's a third reason, one that I discovered, frankly, as I was studying this. I'd never noticed it before. A particular phrase that Paul uses at the very beginning, first sentence of the book of Romans and the last sentence of the book of Romans. Same phrase. 
Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus called to be an apostle set apart, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom you we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Why is it? What is it that's happening there? He, he's, he's, God is, is manifesting something in us to bring about the obedience of faith. Now, what in the world would that mean? Let's, maybe it helps if we'll go on and take a look at the second, second part. And this isn't even a word. This is an entire phrase repeated verbatim. Now to him who's able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. That phrase, the obedience of faith, it's obviously some Paul wanted to emphasize something that the Holy Spirit gave him to put in the opening and the close of the, of the systematic theology book of the Bible, right? The one that we would all read to understand our faith. It's something the Lord desires to see manifested in his church. I think that's pretty obvious. But based on the context in both the uses, it doesn't mean the, it, and here we go again, the, it doesn't mean the coming to faith the justification moment of faith, it's talking about the obedience of, of, of the person walking in faith, of faith, through that whole sanctification. Why are we saved? To walk that way in life. Why? What's the point of that? We'll be drawn closer to Jesus, and as you get closer to Jesus, guess what? You'll look more like him, right? You get transformed into his image. It represents the obedience that believers exhibit because of their faith in Christ. If we turn back to 1 Peter, the phrase there, the obedi for obedience to Jesus Christ, it, it, again, it's not just, I'm gonna try harder to be better. It's obedience to the Lord that's based on faith. The longer I live, the more I understand what Hebrews says, without faith, 11.6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. I have to believe that he is. I have to believe and walk in faith and trust before him. And that, I can't take that and just kind of get up out of bed and decide I'm just gonna go do things for God all day and come back. And I didn't do any of it in faith. I didn't do any of it believing and consciously thinking about, Lord, I'm trying to abide in you, work your will through me. It's just me out doing stuff. Even teaching, preaching. The, the obedience that Peter and Paul both enjoin upon a Christian is not better rule keeping. It's simply walking more closely to the good shepherd through faith in him. I believe you, Lord. And because I believe you, I'm, gonna, I'm going to draw near to you and I'm going to abide in you as your Holy Spirit empowers me. And whatever you lead and then place before me to do, I will do in your strength not because of my own strength. For Lord, I have no strength. My strength comes from you. I can only do anything as you draw me and lay that opportunity before me. I cannot be holy in and of myself. I can't make myself somehow be transformed into the image of Christ. That's the work of God in us, not our work for him. As we believe in him, think about this, as we believe in him and his word more fully, we will walk. Where, where do you go? If you're walking and you, you're, you're doing that, you're believing in God, you desire to abide in him and you're walking, where do you go? Further from sin and closer to Jesus. I don't know what else is happening in route, but I do know that. Every day that I commit to, to abide in him and to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life and to set aside things of the flesh and I want to listen to him and I want to, to be drawn closer in devotion and holiness to him, I'm gonna look around and I'm gonna be a long way from sin. And I think I'll find that I'm 
quite close to my Savior. Believe in all that he says and see if your walk doesn't increase in holiness and devotion. Just believe what he says. Believe what he says. I've learned that there's no substitute for faith, for trust. The second reason why the Father set all this in motion is a really interesting phrase, sprinkling with his blood. Now, the antecedent of the pronoun his is, is, is Jesus. It's not hard to figure out. The, uh, but 17 times, at least in the English Standard Version, the word, some form of the word sprinkle and the word blood are in the same verse. Sprinkling or sprinkle, something like that. And the word blood. And in the Old Testament, it's uh, mostly in the Old Testament, but not entirely. The words denote some process of purification. They would take uh, the blood of the sin offering and they would sprinkle it against the mercy seat or against the altar or against the tent of meeting. There's a number of things. Even the garments. Even the people. Moses would take the blood and throw it out over the people and congregate it in front of him. Applied once a year, Leviticus 16 tells us that uh, on the Day of Atonement, only by the high priest that that blood was applied. The book of Hebrews gives us again that true meaning of the picture from the Old Testament. It's in chapter 9. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, if, that, if even that, just an animal and the blood of goats and bulls and all of us are defiled, and that God still counted that as purifying the flesh? How much more, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, he was the perfect lamb. Remember what John says? John the Baptist, the gospel of John. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When the people of Israel were called out of Egypt. What did they have to do? No, they'd never seen the Passover before. He gave them the instructions, and I'm sure that they're listening, and they're going, I'm supposed to do what? Get a lamb, kill it, capture some of the blood, get a particular plant, a hyssop plant. You know what a hyssop plant did? It was like a, a scrub brush before there were scrub brushes. If you got it in water, it gave you a little, and scrubbed it around, it would give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of almost a sudsy sort of cleansing thing going on with a hyssop plant. Dip the hyssop plant, see the picture, cleansing? Dip the hyssop plant, smear it on the doorpost and the lintel of your door, and then you stay inside. Because the death angel's coming at midnight. And if you're outside, you're dead. But I'm, but I'm an Israelite. What if, he, what if he'd stepped outside, somebody has stepped outside at midnight, as Stephen Davey talked about, he said, uh, what if he stepped outside at midnight just to tell God how good of an Israelite he was? He'd be dead. It's not about us. It's not about how good we are. What is it about? It's about the blood of Jesus. What is it that cleanses us? What is it that sanctifies us? What is it that makes us holy and draws us near to Jesus? It is the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit he offered himself without blemish to God. It's gonna purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It not only atones for our sin, it cleanses our memory of it. it, it not that we don't remember, but it cleanses our recollections and our guilt and our, it, we experience absolute and true forgiveness because it, it, it not only takes the sin away, it tells us that it's gone. It purifies our consciences from dead works. I don't want to be found guilty, or I want to be found guilty very little, because I'm already guilty of it, of bringing dead works to my God. Not about that anymore. I just want to draw near to him and serve him however he says, but it's not going to be me coming up with a plan and going, hey, aren't you proud of this picture? He says, but you missed the five things I really wanted you to do because you were pursuing this in the flesh. Yes, Lord. We see that picture just one chapter later. And with this, we're going to close here shortly. 
Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, what in the world, why would we ever have confidence to enter into the holy place of God? By the blood of Jesus, by, in, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Everything that happened on the cross opens this way for us into God. Since we have this great high priest over the house of God, what do you do? All of that is true. What's my response? Let us draw near. Let us draw near. Let it, it doesn't say, let me go out and think of some five things I need to be doing today for God. Let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, knowing, believing, trusting, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, we're, we are made whole. Mm. How can we draw near to Christ in faith and purity? That's my final question. These will be posted. You can go out and find these questions again if you'd like and think about those. I would love it if you would go back and actually ponder these questions as I'm pondering these questions. How can I draw near to Christ in faith and purity? So the message of 1 Peter is really clear here. It's according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood. Well, who are we as these elect exiles, these sojourners in the world? We're chosen by the Father. Not because of anything in ourselves. We're not smarter, more clever, more righteous, more holy, better looking. None of that applies. Not many were noble. Not many were wealthy. Not many were. Remember what Paul says. Simply by a sovereign grace, he's transformed us and we are continually being made, brought into the image of Jesus Christ through the ongoing work of the Spirit. We're called and enabled to live lives of obedience before Jesus as we walk in faith. Hear me, as we walk in faith. And we're purified to be in his presence, not the blood of bulls and goats, but the unspeakably precious blood of the Son of God. No wonder grace and peace are multiplied. They're not given to us. They're multiplied to us because of who he is, because of who he is. As King David said in Psalm 23, our cup runs over. So bless the Lord on my soul. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we are grateful. Lord, to say we're grateful is an understatement. Lord, we, we would be dead apart from you. We would be lost apart from you. God, it is only because of Father, your work, your foreknowledge that saw all of human history and beyond and decided to make a way. And Jesus, thank you for, for implementing that plan of the Father, for being the mediator, for being that one that comes and gave your life for us. And Holy Spirit, thank you that you're the one who applies that truth to us through years, decades sometimes of life as you work relentlessly and diligently to draw us to yourself and to change us. God, may it be so this week as we desire to serve you. May we do it from faith. And may we stay with you and abide with you. In all things we pray in Jesus' name.